This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Good evening and welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science Lecture Series. My name is Harry Helling. I'm the Executive Director of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps. It is my pleasure tonight to welcome our speaker, Dr. Maya DeVries. Uh, Dr. Maya DeVries holds a bachelor's degree in evolution and ecology from University of California, Davis. She has a PhD from University of California, Berkeley in integrative biology. She holds a Scripps Postdoctoral Scholar Award and an NSF Ocean Sciences Division Postdoctoral Fellowship for her research here. Maya's research focuses primarily on the fundamental relationships between animal form and function and how this relationship helps to shape ecosystems. DeVries integrates tools in biomechanics, animal behavior, and stable isotope ecology. Her current research explores how diet morphology relationships in, in marine animals might shift with the predicted changes in ocean chemistry from climate change. We are very fortunate to have Maya here tonight for her talk entitled, Small But Mighty, Evolution of the Mantis Shrimp Strike. Please welcome Dr. Maya DeVries. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the great introduction. I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, and I can't wait to tell you about these amazing creatures here called the mantis shrimp. So here we see a stomatopod crustacean or mantis shrimp lunging out of its sandy burrow, unfurling its very long appendages to spear this fish prey. And you'll see that the anatomy or the morphology of this appendage has incredible modifications for being able to actually capture this fish prey. And so it has these spines here that it uses to impale this fish prey. And it has movable spines here, actually, that allow it to even further impale the prey between <laughs> these two segments of the appendage. And so today, I'm going to try to tell you about how we think the evolution of the mantis shrimp strike is related to the mantis shrimp diet. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got interested in studying this obscure animal that a lot of people haven't heard of, um, although more people have heard of them now than in the past. The show of hands who heard of mantis shrimp before this talk tonight. That's great. So many people. Usually when I, when I used to ask that question 10 years ago when I started working on these animals, uh, maybe one or two people would raise their hands. But now the entire room does. And I think that goes to show how popular they've become. Uh, so, but before I tell you about how I got interested in them, I want to show you this image. This is Morea French Polynesia. Um, I grew up in Northern California, going to the beach, playing in the inner tidal, uh, but it wasn't until I went to this place that it really solidified my interest in marine biology. So you can see here this beautiful tropical island. You just have to walk out a few steps and you're in the, and you can actually see the coral reef right in front of you. And so if you put on a mask and you look at what's underneath, you see all of this incredible diversity. So we see tons of different fish, fish species and coral species and algae, and it's just teeming with life. And on that trip to Morea, I started to really wonder about how all of these life forms came to be. What are they doing? How do they all make a living? Um, and so naturally, that brought me to work on this animal. Um, this is a largemouth bass. It is a temperate fish that lives in lakes and streams. Um, it is not a coral reef animal. It is not tropical. And yet, I got really excited about this animal when I was an undergraduate at UC Davis um, <laughs> because these animals live in such a variable environment in terms of temperature. So they experience a lot of different temperatures on a daily basis. And so we were curious to know how that affects what they eat. Because the lab I was in was really interested in 
how do organisms capture and consume prey? How do they get energy from their environment? I think we all know that every organism needs to get energy from its environment. It's fundamental to what we do. And so knowing how animals capture and consume prey can tell us a lot about the evolution of the many life forms we see on Earth. A broader question that this lab was interested in was the relationship that we see between feeding morphology and feeding ecology. And this is like a central tenet in ecology, where we see really specialized morphology or specialized anatomy for consuming specific prey types. So here we have the proboscis of the hawk moth that precisely fits into the columbine nectar spur. We also have the jaw of the egg-eating snake that can expand to at least twice the width of its head in order to engulf an egg. These are both classic examples of the tight link we see between feeding morphology and feeding ecology. And generally, with these morphological or anatomical specializations, we see a narrow diet breadth. So we see that, they, that these animals just consume one specific prey type, or maybe a few, but very limited number of prey types. Another very classic example of this are the Galapagos finches. Probably most of you have heard of them. They become so famous because we see a variety of beak forms from these medium ground finch that crush small seeds to these large finches that crush large seeds um, to the cactus finch, which consumes prickly pear. Um, and then these insectivores down here, they all have highly specialized beaks for consuming these specific prey types in these ecological situations. And so Darwin noticed this in the early 1800s, and then fast forward to the uh, 1970s and 80s, we have two very famous evolutionary biologists, Peter and Rosemary Grant, who began to study these animals in detail. And they have um, over 30 years of data on like, every individual that they see on the islands in Galapagos. And uh, one thing that they noticed, which is, was particularly fascinating to me, was that when you look at the medium ground finch and the large ground finch, you see that the distribution of the beak forms change depending on the environment. And so before the drought, you had more of a medium distribution of beaks. After a drought, you have a shift towards a large, uh, towards these larger beaks, and that's because the availability of seeds has changed. And so only, there are only large seeds available because all of the small and medium ground finches have eaten all the other seeds. And so we only have these large seeds available, so only the large finches survive. And so that's why you see the shifting of um, the beak form. And that shows us how important environment is in governing this diet morphology relationship. So with all of these big ideas in my head, I um, decided to go to graduate school at UC Berkeley and study this animal, the stomatopod crustacean, or the mantis shrimp, um, because they too are often touted as having highly specialized morphology. Um, they are also incredibly diverse. There are over 500 species, um, and they're widely distributed in the tropics and subtropics. And uh, so they're diverse in terms of their beautiful color forms, but also in terms of their body sizes. So all of these animals here are scaled to, to their actual body size. So we have really small ones to really large ones, anywhere from a foot to two feet long almost. Um, and um, one little uh, piece of information that most people find very interesting is their eyes, they actually have one of the most complex visual systems in the animal kingdom. And so, um, we have three color pigments, they have 16. They can see an incredible range of wavelengths. Um, we have um, binocular vision, they actually have hexnocular vision, so each eye has trinocular vision, if you can even imagine what that would look like. Um, <laughs> it's hard for us to conceptualize. Um, but they have also become very famous for their raptorial appendage or their predatory appendage because it produces one of the fastest movements in the animal kingdom. And so I got really excited to understand how this movement could have evolved. And so I ask, how and why does specialized morphology limit or enhance diet breath? And in order to answer this question, I look at three different aspects. So the morphology, the diet, and how environment could potentially influence this relationship. Um, I use these different methods to explore these techniques, and, uh, to explore these questions, and um, 
we're first going to look at the morphology, and we're going to focus on the structure and the movement of the appendage, also known as the kinematics. So all of that diversity that I showed you before is typically broken down into two functional groups. So we have smashers and spears. And smashers have this hammer-like bulb at the base of their appendage that they use to literally smash hard-shelled prey. Um, whereas spears, like we saw in that first photo, have these elongate, very uh, hydrodynamic appendages that they use to cut through the water and grab evasive prey. So smashers are the ones that are particularly famous because they uh, produce those incredible movements that I told you about. And these are the ones that you've probably seen in the media. Uh, so they're very popular now in the, in the media. Um, this is a, a section of the oatmeal. I don't know if those of you, sounds like some of you are familiar with the oatmeal. Um, look it up if you haven't seen it. There's a great little comic on these animals. Um, and, this, and in this uh, section, we see the mantis shrimp smashing the limbs off of this crab. So I actually have a video of this to show you guys today, this actual movement. This was taken by my old PhD advisor, Sheila Paddock, and the BBC. Um, and so here you'll see the appendage rotate forward and smash the limb off of this crab. Um, there it is. So this is a high-speed video, slowed down so you can actually see the movement, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to see it. Uh, so again, this is one of the fastest movements in the animal kingdom. It generates forces that are thousands of times the body weight of the animal. The accelerations are comparable to a 22 caliber bullet. And I like to give this analogy. If a mantis shrimp were human size, and if it were to throw a baseball with the same kinematics that you see there, it would actually throw that baseball into orbit around the Earth. So an insanely <laughs> uh, powerful, impressive movement. So now let's look at this smash in real time. Here you see the animal smash this snail. And you know, it kind of flies across the tank a little bit there. But let's slow this down again, because there's something in here that you can't see unless we slow it down. So in this video, again, you'll see the uh, hammer rotate forward and smash this snail. Upon impact, you'll see a flash of light. And then a little bit later, you'll see a second flash of light. And I'll tell you what that is in a second. OK, so the appendage rotates forward, smash it. There's that flash of light. And then there's another flash of light that happens. It's going to happen right around there, right there. OK, so that is called cavitation. Basically, the appendage is moving so fast through water that it creates an area of low pressure that then forms an air bubble. When that air bubble implodes, it releases energy in the form of light and heat that's comparable to the sun. So even that is generating a really <laughs> impressive um, set of forces. And what I find to be particularly incredible is that the snail does not explode upon impact. In fact, it can take up to 80 strikes for a mantis shrimp to open a snail. So that can show you the, the selection pressure of these, of these snails on this movement. Because again, it's creating incredibly impressive forces, and yet the snail is pretty much intact. So how does that compare to the spear? OK, so this is the spear in real time. You're seeing it grab this shrimp off of a stick up there. Um, and this is still a very fast movement. You'll see, that if you look at the kinematics, it's actually 10 times as slow as the smasher and magnitude slower in terms of acceleration compared to the smasher. Um, however, it's still faster than the eye can see. So let's slow that movement down. OK, so this is another high-speed video. Slowed down so you can see it. And you see that uh, the behavior of the movement is much different than the smasher. So the appendages open, they rotate forward, and then they engulf the, the prey. Um, and so again, the behavior is different. The morphology is different. It's still a very fast strike. In fact, it is on the order of the amount of time it takes for a fish to open its jaws or for a squid to protract its tentacles. And so it's still fast enough to capture evasive prey in nature. So if we look at these two side by side, again, you can see that the spears are quite fast, but the smasher just literally blows them out of the water. So how do these animals uh, produce these impressive strikes? 
Well, the raptorial appendage actually functions like a spring. And so here we have a spear, here we have its um, appendage with all the parts labeled, and then here we have line drawings of the appendage, um, and all of these colored elements are actually the spring elements of the exoskeleton. So the exoskeleton itself behaves like a spring. So if you think about a slinky, when you compress the slinky, you're compressing the spring, and that's what happens when the system is loaded. There's a latch right here that you can't see, but when that latch releases, the spring elements release, and that releases the appendage, and it swings forward um, with faster than the eye can see. And so um, we think that the differences between the spearing and the smashing strike are to do with differences in this, in this system, so in these exoskeleton components, and also the difference in the amount of muscle that these different mantis shrimp have. And so spears actually have less muscle, which means that they're not as able to load their spring as well as a smasher. Whereas a smasher has more muscle and they can load their spring a lot better. Uh, okay, so th that's the reason why we think the spears and the smashers might be different. But again, we've just been talking about these two typical spears and smashers, but there's this wide diversity of appendage types that, uh, that we, that we see, and we don't even know how a lot of these animals are moving, we don't know what they're eating, and we don't know what they're doing in nature. So it's really interesting to think about how all of these incredible morphologies may have evolved. So that's a little bit about the morphology. We know that smashing is faster than spearing, um, and that's probably because the spring elements in the appendage are a little bit different. So how, now we can start to think about how diet may have played a role in the evolution of these movements. And particularly, we're going to think about feeding behavior, and we're going to use stable isotope ecology to try to figure out what these animals are eating. So again, we have smashers that are fast and powerful, and we have spears that are fast. So how did the powerful smasher movement evolve in particular? I kind of alluded to this, but we think that Smashers mostly eat hard shell prey because they can generate the forces required to smash these prey items, whereas spears mostly eat evasive soft bodied prey. But we also see that smashers and spears live in different habitats. Most smashers live in these hard substrate, rocky, coral rubble habitats, whereas spears live in these soft substrate, sandy habitats. And so potentially, smashers also need to manipulate their hard substrate, the hard substrate that they live in. And there's another hypothesis, which we're not going to talk much about today, but it turns out that smashers spend a lot of time beating each other up. And so they're highly competitive. Um, they are constantly competing for space. It's really hard to find the coral rubble cavities in which they live, so they're constantly trying to uh, fight with each other to gain access to those cavities. And so that is another hypothesis for the evolution of this movement. And so we think all of these are probably um, acting in concert to yield the amazing smashing appendage that we see, uh, but today we're primarily going to focus on the diet one because that's the primary hypothesis and the one that is kind of most fascinating in the broader ecological context of specialized morphology and specialized diet. So I think I've convinced you now that smashers have highly specialized morphology for producing speeds and acceler accelerations that are insanely fast. Uh, and so does that lead to a narrow diet of just hard shell prey, or does it lead to a wide diet? And we actually have anecdotal observations of smashers consuming soft-bodied evasive prey um, from around the 80s. And so we wanted to test if that, was, if that was really an important part of their diet or not. And so um, we tested the hypothesis that smashing mantis shrimp may actually be generalist predators that consume a wide range of different prey types. So in order to test this hypothesis, we needed to know, do smashers have a varied diet? What do they eat? It turns out this is not an easy question to answer. We can't just watch mantis shrimp to figure out what they're eating because they're quite cryptic. Uh, we also can't just open up their stomachs to see what they're eating because they digest their prey too quickly. So we had to combine an abundance study and a feeding experiment with a, with a stable isotope analysis of diet in order to figure out what they're eating. 
This is the mantis shrimp that I focused on. This is Neogonodactylus breedeni. This video is in real time, and so you can see it smashing the apex of that snail right off. So I just wanted to show you this video to demonstrate that, that this is kind of a typical smasher. It's pretty small. This animal is probably about four centimeters, um, but it still packs a very powerful punch. So this is my field site. This is the Galata Marine Laboratory at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. Um, and here you're facing the field station, but if you were actually to, were to turn around and walk about three miles, then you would hit the Caribbean side of the Panama Canal. So it's actually located very close to the Panama Canal. And this is a really neat field site because there are two habitats that N. Breed and I live in. Uh, it lives in this seagrass habitat and also this coral rubble habitat. So we can look at diet across both of these habitat types to really understand the complete diet breadth of uh, the smashing mantis shrimp. A lot of people are often curious about how we capture these animals. And so I have a video of my old undergraduate, Summer Webb, um, collecting these animals in the field. She is actually going to start as a graduate student here at Scripps um, in the fall, and we're very excited about that. And she's also here in the audience if you wanted to talk to her later. Um, so here you're going to see Summer. So what we do is we collect these coral rubble pieces that the mantis shrimp live in, in both of these habitats. And then with a hammer, we try to uh, break open the coral rubble cavity, but we also try to preserve it because we like to return them back so that other mantis shrimp can live in them later. Um, Summer dumps it out of there, and then there you see. So now also this gives you some perspective about the size of the mantis shrimp relative to, to us. So these guys are pretty small. And because it's Panama, we have to go out with the ecological police. And that was our police friend saying, good job. <laughs> <laughs> so now you see how we collect the mantis shrimp. I'll go back to tell you now a little bit about how we perform these studies. So in order to figure out what mantis shrimp were eating, First, we did an abundance count of all the potential prey items that we thought mantis shrimp could be eating. And then we took the most common ones and saw our mantis shrimp capable of eating those prey items. So here are the common ones that we found. We have hard-shelled prey over here. And then we have soft-bodied and or evasive prey over here. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, snapping shrimp, that sounds like a hard-shelled prey item to me. Uh, we know from feeding observations that snapping shrimp are consumed only just with a few strikes in a very similar way that these other prey items are consumed, and that's why we put it in this category. These hard-shelled prey items, however, take a number of strikes to, to actually get to the tissue that the animals consume. So that's why we use these prey categories. Okay, so then we wanted to know, what will N. breedeni actually eat? If we give it a prey item, will it eat it? So we had this tank system here, where we had 16 tanks, and this was my field assistant at the time, Gabrielle Tomas, who helped me to set up this system. Um, and in each tank, we would put one mantis shrimp and one prey item, and then we would wait to see if the mantis shrimp would eat the prey item. And if it didn't eat it after four days, we would end the trial. So it was very simple, but it was easy for us to see uh, what these animals were capable of consuming given their smashing appendages. And so this is what we found. We have hard-shelled prey uh, and soft-bodied prey here. And then we have the number of trials out of 10 in which prey were consumed. And so the first thing you notice is, yes, they do eat hard-bodied prey, but when given the opportunity, they will not shy away from soft-bodied or evasive prey. So we know perhaps not surprisingly, that their appendage morphology allows them to consume these uh, very different prey items than what we had expected. And so even though the literature tells us that they mostly eat hard shell prey, they will include these other prey items in their diet if given the chance. But what are they actually eating in the field? So in order, now we kind of had a general idea of what they could possibly consume. Now we wanted to know what they were actually eating in the field. So we needed a complete picture of diet breath over space and time. In order to do that, we did a stable isotope analysis of diet uh, because it can tell you about diet over space and time, which is exactly what we were looking for. So back to chemistry 101 for a second. Um, a stable isotope is when there was one more neutron in the nucleus than the normal atom. So carbon-13 has 13 neutrons, carbon-12 um, is the normal atom and it has 12 neutrons in the nucleus. And so um, 
With metabolism, the heavier isotope actually generally remains in the system, but the lighter isotope is excreted. And also, I should mention, the reason why we call these stable isotopes is because the ratio of the heavy to the light isotope does not change through time. So perhaps some of you have heard of radiocarbon isotopes or radioisotopes, that, and they do change through time, and that's how we use um, isotopes to date things. But these do not change through time, but they do change with metabolism, and that's why we can use this ratio to understand how energy is moving through a food web or through an ecosystem. And so we particularly focused on carbon-13, the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12, and we also looked at the ratio of nitrogen-15 to nitrogen-14. And we also we use this delta notation to denote this ratio. And typically, with carbon-13, um, it tells us where the animal's eating. So, so the stable isotope ratios are different depending on habitat. So we have coral rubble here and seagrass here. And then with nitrogen-15, perhaps you've heard this before, you are what you eat. Well, we like to say in stable isotope ecology that with nitrogen, you are what you eat plus three parts per mil. Because typically, as you go up the food chain, the ratio of the heavy to the light isotope increases. And so together with carbon and nitrogen, we can look at them together to understand how, um, what mantis shrimp are actually eating. I told you that this also, that there's a time component to this, so stable isotopes can tell us the um, diet over certain time frames. So I will briefly tell you that we figured out um, the muscle, the time frame that muscle represents. And so um, here we have time on the x-axis and nitrogen on the y-axis, and all of these data points are individual mantis shrimp that we sampled throughout our experiment. So we actually fed all of these mantis shrimp one prey item, and then we saw how long it took for the mantis shrimp stable isotope values to look like the predator stable isotope values. So how long does it take for the mantis shrimp diet to reflect a change in diet that we induced in the lab? And it turns out when you do some math, it's about 80 days. And so the time frame the tissue represents uh, is 80 days. And so when we look at muscle, we can say this was the diet consumed in the past 80 days. So that gives us an idea of time. So now we're curious, OK, well, what are they actually eating? I know I keep saying this, and, but it's, it was a really long process to figure out what they were eating. <laughs> and so. Um, now we were able to really finally get to the heart of the question. So we collected mantis shrimp and all of their possible prey from their habitats. And then we dissected out the muscle of the prey and of the predator. And then we could compare the stable isotope values of the prey to the predator. And this was my undergraduate at the time, Julia Hassan, um, doing all the dissections for this analysis. OK, so when we have all the muscle tissue of the predator and the prey, we run it through a stable isotope mass spectrometer. And we get uh, the carbon values and the nitrogen values. And typically, in stable isotope ecology, we plot the carbon on the x-axis and the nitrogen on the y-axis. And, and then so here we have all of the different prey. Uh, the mean and the standard deviation of all the different prey, and then each of these data points are the individual mantis shrimp in this study. And so here we have coral rubble, and here we have seagrass, and I think right off the bat you can see that mantis shrimp are falling quite close to clams, maybe alpheids and worms, and also fish in both habitats. Because uh, again, we can compare the values of the mantis shrimp to those of the predators to try to understand what they're eating. And then um, we can also use a mixing model, um, which tells us, if we think about the predator tissue as a mixture of all of the different prey that it's consuming, uh, we can use a mixing model to figure out what are the proportional contributions of each of those different prey items to the mixture or the predator tissue. And so we run this mixing model, and we get the proportional contributions of all the different prey to the diet. And I think you see that clams are a surprisingly important part of the diet, but so are fish. And that is actually not the soft body prey item that I thought would be important. But it turns out that these mantis shrimp are consuming a lot of fish in their habitat. So I think that this study tells us that 
Specialized morphology, so the specialized smashing morphology, does not uh, limit mantis shrimp to a narrow diet. In fact, it broadens their diet. And perhaps this species is actually a generalist predator um, that consumes a wide diversity of different prey. And that is not what we had expected. So if we come back to our original question, we can think about that smashing morphology does not limit diet. And so now we can look at how environments, particularly ocean acidification and ocean warming, could influence this diet morphology relationship. How could this potentially shift um, given the what we know is coming. We know that the ocean is becoming more acidic. We know that the ocean is warming. How is this going to potentially affect the mantis shrimp strike? For a little bit of background, um, I think it's no secret that ocean acidification affects calcified structures. So you've probably heard of um, uh, snails and clams uh, kind of dissolving in the, in the current ocean um, and in predicted future ocean conditions. We also have foraminifera and corals that are predicted to suffer. Um, but interestingly, crustaceans seem to show a different response. And so crustaceans either show no changes to their calcified exoskeleton or they show an increase in calcification. So uh, kind of a more hardier exoskeleton compared to these other animals. So to understand why that could potentially be happening, I'll just do a quick run through of, of why the ocean is becoming more acidic. So I think we all know that, um, that we are burning more fossil fuels and that's releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, the ocean then absorbs CO2 and that reacts with water and carbonate to form carbonic acid. And then the carbonic acid breaks down into the hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. And then interestingly, bicarbonate breaks down and reforms. Because it breaks down and reforms, that actually means more bicarbonate in the water and less carbonate available for animals that use calcium carbonate to build shells. And so that's why we think that mollusks and corals are having a harder time building their shells because there's actually less um, carbonate available for them to build their shells. But interestingly, it's possible that crustaceans are using the bicarbonate ion to build their exoskeleton, and that's why we see these differences, although that's a huge hypothesis right now that remains to be tested. But given that ocean acidification can affect organisms with calcified structures, we wanted to know how is ocean acidification and ocean warming potentially going to affect mantis shrimp? Because Crustaceans are highly dependent on their exoskeletons, but mantis shrimp are, even, are just even more dependent on their exoskeletons because they produce this incredibly impressive movement with their spring-like appendage. And so think about how that movement could be affected by ocean acidification. If we were to see an increase in calcification, for example, would it mean that the mantis shrimp is no longer able to operate the spring? Would it mean that the spring is even more powerful? We didn't know, and we wanted to find out. So we predicted for this question that we would see changes in the exoskeleton structure and composition. And we thought that these changes could then alter the exoskeleton material properties that would then have large ramifications for its ability to produce its incredibly fast movement. So this was our experimental setup here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, and here we have 70 cups with 72 mantis shrimp in them. And we have uh, three treatments. We have ambient, we had a low pH treatment, and a low pH high temperature treatment. And these were all based on the IPCC predictions for the next 100 years of, of how the ocean's going to look in 100 years. And we sampled animals at three months and at six months. And we looked at the merus, which is the part of the appendage where the spring is located. And we looked at the smashing surface of the appendage, which is the dactyl. And we compared those to a less specialized form, uh, or less specialized piece of exoskeleton, which is the carapace. So these are scanning electron micros um, microscope images, so SEM images, of the merus in cross-section and the carapace in cross-section. So we were actually able to chop these 
uh, exoskeletons in order to get a cross section of the very thin exoskeleton and look at it under this very high powered microscope to see the differences. And so here we see all the different layers that are labeled, the epicuticle, the exocuticle, and the endocuticle. And you see differences between the merus and the carapace, but actually when we looked across treatments, uh, we saw no differences in structure, and we saw slight changes in the composition of the merus because we were able to use this technique to, to understand the uh, elemental composition of the structure as well. And there were slight changes in the merus, but not in the carapace. When we used CT scans, which perhaps some of you in the hospital have had a CT scan, well, we did that with a mantis shrimp. Um, we used CT scans to look at the dactyl heel or the smashing surface, and we also saw no changes in mineral density there. Uh, so then we wanted to look at the material properties, and here's Summer Webb again using the nano indenter. The nano indenter here, as you can see in this schematic, applies a known force to a material, and then that can tell us how hard and how stiff the material is. And so we did that to the, for the merus and the carapace. And we found that interestingly, the carapace uh, and the carapace changed in hardness and stiffness over time, but the merus didn't change at all. So here you see three months and six months, all of our treatments, and the carapace got harder over time and stiffer over time, but the merus didn't. And so we think that possibly those slight changes in the mineral composition of the merus are allowing it to maintain the functionality of the appendage, and so we think it might preferentially be maintaining the functionality of the appendage because of the important spring-like properties. And so, again, structure did not change, but there were slight changes in the composition of the merus, and the carapace was harder and stiffer over time, but the merus showed no response. And so we think that n breed and I responds differently to reduced, in pH, uh, reduced pH and increased temperature compared to most other crustaceans. And it's really neat to think that actually one part of the mantis shrimp is responding differently to another part of the mantis shrimp. So why is this happening? Well, back in the field, Summer and I took some samples of, to try and get an idea of the pH and temperature regime in the habitat that these animals actually live in. And we found that they experience a pretty wide range in pH, which means a pretty wide change in the amount of CO2 in the water. Um, and so perhaps they are adapted to these daily fluctuations in pH and temperature. And perhaps that means that they're going to be robust to future ocean conditions as well. So now we know that at least in terms of uh, ocean acidification and ocean warming, uh, there's going to be no effect of, uh, of these environmental factors on the diet morphology relationship. But that, of course, breezes over the incredible diversity, again, that we see of the mantis shrimp appendage. So here is the phylogeny, or the family tree, of, the, uh, of all of mantis shrimp. And it's actually time calibrated with a fossil, so we know how long ago all of these splits in the family tree happened. And here we have kind of a smattering of all of the different appendage types that you can see. And again, I'd like to emphasize that we know very little about what most of these animals are doing, how they're making a living, what they're eating, where they're living. And so while the intertidal Neogonodactylus breed and I species may be fine with future conditions, we don't know how the environment is going to affect the diet morphology relationship and all of the other mantis shrimp that we see. And also, it's really exciting to think about now that we have the tools to look at diet across the phylogeny, and we have the tools to look at environmental uh, responses to uh, across the phylogeny. We can begin to look at correlations between diet and morphology across all mantis shrimp to really understand the evolution and the future of these animals. And so I think we learned two things from this research. Um, the first is that morphology can either narrow diet, like these, um, like these classic examples that we saw before, or it can broaden diet. And so here we have the mantis shrimp. And interestingly, there are a number of fish species that show this same pattern. So I was excited to be able to go back to my fish roots um, because I learned that a lot of these fish also have highly specialized uh, feeding apparatuses for consuming specific prey. This is a classic example. This is the, um, 
the uh, cichlid fish in Africa, and basically it has, uh, some of these animals have jaws that are highly specialized to eat the scales off of other fish, off of the left side or the right side of other fish, and yet when you look at their diets, they have very broad diets that include plankton and other little crustaceans in the water, and so it's quite possible that this pattern of specialized morphology yielding a more broad diet is quite pervasive in nature, and I think that um, the, the better our technology gets at looking at diet, we may see that even these classic examples of specialized diets, perhaps these animals have a more broader diet than we, than we currently think. And so what does this mean for the ecosystem? Uh, in particular, the intertidal ecosystem where these mantis shrimp live. Well, we know now that these guys consume many different prey items, and we know that they're consumed by a bunch of different predators as well. So the literature tells us that lionfish, octopuses, snappers all eat mantis shrimp. And so I think that these guys are really important links in the trophic food web of the intertidal and that they're often very overlooked. And again, I will emphasize that mantis shrimp are incredibly diverse. They are small and they are mighty, um, but they pack a very powerful punch. And they, we know very little about what all of these animals are doing in nature. And I think that um, they're all playing a very important role in the ecosystems that they live. And I look forward to figuring out what those patterns are in the future. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone who helped me along the way. Um, and, and I would also like to let you know that just this week, or late last week, um, <laughs> a little Neogonodactylus breed and I was put into the bleached coral reef tank. So you see him, he's right there. There's a blown up view. Um, and so it's kind of neat to me that he was put in the bleached coral, well, she actually, I think, that she was put in the bleached coral reef tank because we think mantis shrimp, at least this species, is going to be so robust to climate change that perhaps this is the future of, for this species, and, and this is where it will be living. Um, so if you have a chance, go check him out. And with that, um, I would like to take questions. Thank you. Okay, yes, so what caused the second cavitation event that we saw in that video? Uh, it's the same concept. So the appendage is actually moving so fast past that section of water, essentially, that it vaporized that bit of water around that appendage. And so I know, so the bubble itself didn't form and implode until after the appendage had passed that area, uh, but it's still the same concept. Does that answer the question? <laughs> It's hard, there was, yeah, there's a delay in that video between when the bubble forms and implodes so that you can actually see it and um, um, when the appendage is moving past. But that's actually quite typical. We have a number of videos that show the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, so is the appendage used in defense? Uh, yes, and I, I alluded to that a little bit when I talked about how mantis shrimp beat up each other in nature. They also try to beat up their predators, use it as exactly what you're saying, to defend their coral bubble cavities or to defend themselves if they're gonna be eaten. And absolutely, that is probably very important in the evolution of this strike. Um, we're still trying to figure that out. Many researchers are working on that, that's like the uh, you know, $64 million question. Um, <laughs> but we know that this split between spearing and smashing seems to be more driven by diet, but the insane movements, um, it's highly likely that, that um, aggressive interactions and defense and all of the things that you're talking about um, played a very important role as well. Yes. Is it true that mantis shrimp often are put in aquariums until they break the glass? It is. <laughs> we were, in fact, just talking about this before. The um, oh yeah, sorry. So, um, uh, do mantis shrimp break glass? It has been known to happen. Uh, and in fact, uh, Roy Caldwell, who's the mantis shrimp expert at UC Berkeley, who took many of the photos that you see here, um, 
has had every kind of mantra shrimp that you can imagine. And just recently, uh, one of his mantra shrimp broke the incredibly thick aquarium glass that he has in his lab. And so usually, we use a lot thicker glass in order to, to keep these animals. Um, and, but sometimes they still get through, so yes. Uh, this little guy, I think, is in a pretty tough material as well. But he's so small that he's probably not going to be able to break glass. Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. Um, the question was, <laughs> I keep forgetting to repeat it. Um, so how quickly can they reload? Uh, in an aggressive interaction, it's actually pretty fast. And there are researchers working on this to kind of try to figure out the neural mechanisms behind what's governing these strikes. Um, and so I can't give you a number, but it happens pretty quickly. They can uh, you know, sometimes smash. Uh, multiple times, but when they're feeding, they do generally take breaks. So they'll smash, then they'll, then they'll manipulate the prey a little bit, then they'll smash again, and maybe manipulate it a little bit more. But it is on the order of milliseconds that they, that they can reload. Mm -hmm. so number of strikes in one minute? Number of strikes in one minute? Um, uh, that is a good question. Um, I would have to think about it, but I'm guessing probably 30. If they don't tire out, mm -hmm. yeah, they do get pretty tired. So when it takes them a number of strikes to get into a prey at them, it, I mean, they'll be working on it for a very long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you mentioned the uh, climate through the acidity of the water. But what about climate effects on their diet that could be, say, predators? It, could predators have an effect on their diet? Oh, OK, can predators have an effect on their diet? Uh, absolutely. And I, we're start, I'm starting to look at this a little bit. Um, so predators can influence the, probably the accessibility of their prey, for example. So, um, and I think that's definitely happening. What we see with these animals is they really just try. We have some um, videos of them feeding in the field, and they really seem to try to just get whatever is near them. And I think that's one reason why fish is probably a pretty important component of the diet in breed and I, because they can just, just like the spear, they can sit in their burrows, and then they can just capture prey swimming overhead. Um, so I think predators are probably influencing the diet in that respect. Mm -hmm. uh, how were you introduced to the oatmeal comic? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Uh, who introduced me to the oatmeal comic? I think it was uh, it was just sent around. I mean, all of us in the management community were like, this thing is amazing. And I think it was sent to me like five times in one day. Um, yeah, and I just, I, I actually didn't really know much about the oatmeal before this comic, but now I, now I love it. Mm -hmm. Are the shrimp territorial, and how wide is their territory? They are territorial in the sense that they defend their home burrows or their home cavities. Um, in terms of the actual space around their cavities, they aren't really territorial in that sense. They don't really maintain a home range. They just maintain their cavities. Mm -hmm. But they can have multiple cavities in a habitat, which is kind of fun. So they'll have ones that they sleep in at night. They literally, I mean sleep, but they literally put a rock in front of their burrow at night and then just hunker down for the evening. Um, and then they have other cavities that they go to to feed during the day and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that there's a change in the carapace with the acidification. So is that meaning that it's thinner? And is there any concern for them now to be uh, attacked more easily by the predator? I mean, they may be able to feed. Right, so is their carapace, how are these changes in the carapace going to affect their, their defense system if other animals attack them? Um, that's a good question. So actually, um, the carapace is becoming harder and stiffer over time. And so really, uh, we don't know functionally what this is going to mean, but I predict that they will actually be better able to defend themselves. 
because it's kind of a harder, thicker, or not thicker, but a harder and a stiffer material. It isn't actually becoming thicker when we measure the morphology. Um, when we actually measure those cross sections, it's, that's not changing. It's just the material properties and the mineral composition of the carapace. Maybe one more question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that these are tropical and subtropical animals, which means we don't have them here. Uh, what's their northern we do actually have them here, and I should have thrown that in here. Um, we have a few species here in California. Their northern range, at least here, is about Point Conception. And um, in fact, it's really interesting that one of the species that we have here is called Hemisquilla californiensis, and it is this, actually it's this intermediate form, and it's really cool. Um, it looks, it's kind of hard to see here, but it looks like a cross between a spear and a smasher, so it has this kind of spear, but it doesn't have any spines, and it sort of has a little hammer at the base. Um, and it's really neat because you can see that it actually is also at the base of the phylogeny. And so it is the animal that looks closest uh, to its fossil relatives. And I think that's very exciting that that's the an animal that we have here in California. Um, we haven't started studying them yet, but I really hope to look at them before I leave um, Scripps. Thank you. Thank you.